We're going to be discussing ministering gifts of the Spirit this morning. And we're going to turn you children loose in just a minute, but I want to tell everybody uh, this. This is something I feel in my heart to tell you. It's nothing big or profound or anything like that. But uh, I, I was shocked when I watched the, the news yesterday. Anybody watch it? California is under siege again. Folks, now I don't mean to be a bearer of bad news, and you can reject this if you want. But that kind of stuff will intensify out there. It's going to intensify. You're going to see more of it across the land of America. Uh, this, hear me, this country is going to be reduced if it doesn't repent. And I don't believe, uh, you know, from all outward signs that a country as a nation, as a whole, that it's going to. The, uh, I know that's bad news, that's negative, but you remember I sat here and told you this. Soon and very soon, cities are going to go broke. They're not going to be able to play, pay their police force. And that's going to allow crime to run more rampant in the streets. Because of major depression of individuals, many more are going to resort to crime. Because that the welfare system, it, we, look, you know, I'm not supporting any political view this morning. But we're at a place where we have, you know, we can't afford it no more. We can't afford a lot of those programs. I look for them to be cut out. When that happened, you're already seeing people growing angry. They, they were, Gingrich was going to talk the other day. There was a bunch of them filled the place with signs and chanting and hollering and going on because you're cutting out our income. You, know, you take people's income. There are people that have lived their lives that way. They've lived their lives that way. And you take that away from them, all of a sudden their job, their income, their home, their food, it's all gone. You think they won't take to the streets, folks? I believe we're going to see some of the worst rioting in inner cities in the very near future than we've ever seen. I believe that. I believe that because this is going to spark off racial uh, prejudices and there's going to be racial riots. Now, put your gun up. Put your gun up. Put it up. They better not come around and I'll shoot. Put your gun up. We're going to win them with the love of God. I'm going to tell them I ain't got none in my cupboard either, but I've got a God that sees to it that I eat every day. And you know, and you know what? Gingrich or none of the rest of them can affect his welfare system. You know, he will, uh, he'll help you. Wouldn't you like to serve him? They'll melt right before you when the love of God. You see, folks, uh, people don't. I've been rebuked over this before. But the Bible says the goodness of God leads men to repentance it was when they see that love and mercy that was shed for for you know uh, i've never seen any experience last very long that you scared someone into the altar now i'm not against what mike does that needs to be done and people need to realize hey they, they need their system shocked and they need to realize hey I, you know i'm playing church and all like that but that should wake them up to some things that hey there's a god suffered that i don't have to go through what this man's going through you know anyway I believe you're going to see that. Now, let me tell you what I feel that, that, that some of you are, are going to be, and I have some scripture to back this. Come to me while I was studying this morning. It come to me. I believe there will come a time when you will be called upon by the Lord that you serve to do certain things for him, and you're not going to have the means to do it. Now, you say, well, he wouldn't do that. Oh, wouldn't he? You want me to give you some scripture? There were 5,000 people out in the wilderness, and Jesus said, give them something to eat. They said, Lord, we, we don't have enough to feed this bunch. We don't, well, why, it would take a bunch of food to feed this crowd. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. You don't have nothing, but give it to them anyway. And when they reached, they said, oh, he said, what? He said, all right, what have you got? I ain't got nothing but two dollars in my pocket. Then you use that. I ain't got nothing but a gallon of milk. Use it. I ain't got nothing but a Bible and two or three tracks. Use it. He said, what you got? We ain't got nothing but a, a, a couple of loaves and, and a couple of fishes. He said, set them down. Well, hey, well what are you going to do? You're going to take your two loaves and your, your two fishes. You're going to feed these guys. I believe before long that you will be presented with opportunity where you're going to have to minister to people and you ain't got a thing to minister to them with. 
Folks, remember I'm standing here telling you, it's the reason we're putting this on tape. I feel this prophetically. I feel that. I feel that somewhere down the road in the very near future, you're going to see that. I also believe what I just said, you can just look for it. Look for, for police departments to be laid off because there's no money to pay them. Look for a lot of unrest in inner city. Look for riots, burning, looting, worse than you've ever seen. Look for California to continue to be bombarded. Look for America to witness freak weather patterns and that type of thing. Because I'm going to tell you what. Uh, it's to be. Now, I know that's not popular with a lot of the big name ministries. But you remember a little fellow stood here and told you that. Now, go ahead and let the children be dismissed. And you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, would uh, would someone get me a glass of water back here right quick so I won't have to lay this down. Okay, thank you. 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to talk a little bit about spiritual gifts. I am aware of the fact that there have been extremities in the area of spiritual gifts. I'm aware of the fact that churches and ministries have been built off of nothing but gifts. Gifts are stressed, emphasis are laid upon them heavily, and that's all right up to a point, but you can't build a church on just gifts of the Spirit. You can't build a ministry on just gifts of the Spirit. There's got to be some other things in there. However, because there's been some extremes and some abuses, we don't want to be guilty of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and do away with gifts of the Spirit altogether. Everything that God has provided for us, it is our duty and our privilege to enjoy them and to experience them. Excuse me. Gifts of the Spirit were placed in the body for a reason and they're to not be excluded. Have you got 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Keep in mind that the scriptures are, is God expressing his feelings about a particular subject to us. This is what God wants. This is God talking to us. And he says now concerning, first one, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, who's brethren? That's not sinners. Spiritual gifts doesn't make any, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it doesn't apply to a lost man. He's lost. There's no need to try and tell him about spiritual gifts. You need to tell him about repentance and getting right with God and the consequences of rejecting the gospel. So this is to brethren. And he said, I would not have you ignorant. God does not want you and I to remain in ignorance when it concerns spiritual gifts. He wants us to be schooled and he wants us to be knowledgeable about the gifts of the Spirit. He wants us to have a working knowledge of them. Now, he gives the gifts of the Spirit. Jump on down to verse 4. It says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, what does diversities mean? Everybody tell me. Different kinds of gifts. There are various kinds of gifts, but it's the same Spirit that gives them. There may be different kinds, but there's only one Spirit, and He's the one that brings all of them in all their various types and forms. Now, look at the verse 5. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. What's the NIV say? Okay. Uh, that's good enough. Uh, administrations, I, you know, uh, pardon? There are different ways... That these gifts can interchange, interact, working together, but it's still all the same Lord. God is not limited to doing things just one way. Let me give you just a real quick scripture account. Bartimaeus was blind as a bat. He cried out, O son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus spoke the word to him and healed him. Another blind man came and he put spittle and mud and smeared it on his eyes and told him to go wash. Same gift, but a different way it operated. See what I'm saying? God is not limited to doing a certain thing a certain way all the time. And we are in danger when we want to limit God of doing You know, I've heard people say, well, when 
I got filled with the Holy Ghost, or when this happened to me, I was crawling on the floor, jumping in the corner. That's great. You know, that's fine. But that doesn't mean I have to get it that way. Well, when I was healed, they come to my bed and all laid hands on me and anointed me with oil on the Lord. That's fine, but I don't have to be healed that way. You know, well, when I was healed, the man just spoke the word. What I'm saying is, folks, if God does something, don't just limit him to doing it that way every time. You can't put a formula on God. He won't adapt to that. He, he, won't, he won't cater to it. Now, look at verse 6. And there are diversities of operations. There are different ways these things work. But it's the same God which works all in all. Verse 7 says, But the manifestation is given to every man to profit with all. Read me NIV. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I should get my NIV and bring it out here, shouldn't I? What's it say? Okay, that was what I was looking for. The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good of everybody. We are given gifts of the Spirit, brother and sister, not to impress our neighbor, not to impress the church down the street, not to entertain one another. God have mercy. I've been to services where they say, all right, let's get the singing out of the way, do away with the preaching of the Word. That's not, you know, real important. Let's get right into the gifts. And they've got to be entertained. They're not given for entertainment. They're given to profit, to bless, to help, to comfort, to edify, to uplift. And notice it says to every man they're given. Every man. No one is excluded. Now, we use the verse of Scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And where it says whosoever or the world, we put our name there. Has anybody ever done that? I know we've done that back when I was a kid. They'd say, now put your name there. For God so loved Bruce Hall. That whosoever, put your name there. Bruce Hall, believe on him. You know. So do we have a right to do that? Absolutely. Anywhere the Bible says whosoever or any man or anyone or whatsoever or if anybody, that takes in exactly what it says anybody. It doesn't exclude anyone. And it says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Put your name there. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to, there you go, to Bruce. You can put your name there. You need to go home and do that and let that sink down inside of you and realize that the manifestation of the Spirit has already been given. We're begging God for something that He's already given. Then why is there a lack of it? Many times it just needs to be stirred. Number one, it needs to be discovered. It needs to be stirred, activated, and released in you. Because there is a deposit in you, and, and, and it's there for a reason. Now, uh, verse 11 says the same thing. But all these work at that one and self-same spirit dividing to who? Put your name there. Every man, severally as he will. God has divided to you something. Now, the teaching uh, in the world is, is usually that everybody has all the gifts and God will work whatever gift He wants to, when He wants to, through you. Just be obedient and He'll just work whatever He wants. Okay, I don't limit God and say He can't do that. But I believe there is an area of gifting that you will major in. I believe there is a gift of the Spirit that is given to you. God placed it in you. The Scriptures bear this out. It's not your gift and, and, and it's mine and you can't have it and I'm not going to give it to you. No, it's not that. But the Bible tells us if there's no interpreter there, then let the one that speaks in tongues be silent. Now, now, what about if everybody can just up and interpret? The Bible, you know, lets us know if there's no interpreter there. In other words, there's someone we can recognize that has that gift. And maybe, and it's not just limited to one. And one may have the, the gift of a word of knowledge to where just a word comes to them. Another may have the same gift, but they get it in the form of a vision or a mental picture or something like that. You know, that's the diversities of operations in the way this is. Every last one of you has one or more of these gifts residing in you that God will work on a regular basis. You must uncover or discover them, and they must be stirred, activated, released, and then guess what? It profits everybody. 
It's a blessing for them. You know. Now, there is no such thing as nobody not having anything. There are a number of ways you can discover your gifting. Somebody give me some ideas if you want to. Let's go over to 1 Timothy. We'll show you one way. This is one of the many. And this is why if there is true, and I, folks, hear me. I know there's a lot of hype in the church world. I know there's a lot of fakery and chicanery. But listen, don't do away. There's also some true stuff out there. Everybody's not on the heap. Everybody's not false. There are some true ministries out there. God placed prophets in the church. He placed the gift of prophecy in the church. And it's there. And listen, I believe that if you get hungry enough that you can go on the search for it. And your hunger and your faith will put a demand on that gift in someone's life. And it will cause it to come uh, be activated for your good. Now, but Brother Bruce... uh, I had a man do that, and, it, and he wound up, he run off with the piano player and was a adulterer, you know. I don't want to tell you to accept everything that come along, but I wanted to throw this thought at you. Folks, Judas Iscariot was a devil from day one. And he went out with the other twelve and healed people, and there were people that were healed and blessed under his ministry. Do you think they should discard their experience because they heard Judas Iscariot hung himself? I wouldn't. You do what you want. If a man prays for me and my body is healed and I find out later the guy's a homosexual, I'm not going to discard my experience. You do what you want. Now, that doesn't mean I've got to follow off after his doctrine. You follow their faith, not their doctrine. Now, here's one of the ways... And this is why I encourage you to go where there is true, genuine, prophetic ministry. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Where's that? And, and look at verse 14. We've got to hurry because I've got some other things I've got to say here. Everybody got that? 1 Timothy 4, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee. How was it given to me? By prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Brother Bruce, you can't give spiritual gifts away. No, I don't give them away, but God might use me to give them. He might use you to give them. There are times that he uses prophecy and laying on of hands to impart gifts to you. And when that happens, brother, sister, don't you. Now, don't get cocky about it, but don't deny it either. Another way that God, and this is one of the best ways, and this was used in in the early, I can show you if we had time, I can show you other cases where this happened in the book of Acts. People were activated into their ministry by the laying on of hands and by prophecy being spoke over them. We just don't realize it. Do you know that happened to the apostle Paul? Think about it. When he was blind, God picked a man. Ananias, and he sent him in there, and he laid his hands on him for him to receive his sight, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, he's getting everything all at once, wasn't he? Brother Paul, the Lord sent me, the one that appeared to you on the road. You're going to receive your sight, you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're going to suffer a lot for his name. Man, that wasn't a very encouraging prophecy. For the Lord's called you to the Gentiles, you're going to bear his name before kings. He's called you to be apostle into the ministry, and so Ananias done that. Now, Paul could have done what, like a lot of us, he could have said, wonder, wonder is Ananias really true? I bet the, the guy is just trying to, to uh, impress everybody. I bet he's a big jerk. Guess what that would have done? That would have really messed his... Uh, it would have negated what he had received. You know, I can I can receive something right from God and speak it to you, but you've got to receive it. If you don't receive it, guess what it's going to do? We're going to have a stillborn ministry there, a stillborn gift. It's 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 going to abort. It won't it won't impregnate your spirit. When that word is spoken under the inspiration, folks, it impregnates your spirit, man, and causes a gifting, a ministry, or whatever to be formed, and then there's time that it will give birth to that. You see what I'm saying? Now, there are other ways besides this. How are other ways that God can lead you into your area of gifting? He can do it by something else. Somebody give me an idea. Hmm? Okay. But how do I know that's an anointing? It works. You know, a lot of times by trial and error 
There are certain people that pray for every sick person they can come across. I mean, they pray for them, and they've told me, and I know one fellow right now, some of you here know him, prayed for a lot of sicknesses, but when he prays a lot of time for heart trouble or for arthritis or for cancer, he has almost, uh, well, I wouldn't say 100%, but a very large way up there success ratio where he prays for other things and sometimes there's no results. I myself, there are certain things I prayed for, laid my hands, tried to believe the best I could, and there was nothing. I prayed for a person with some other thing, and almost every time I pray for someone with that particular thing, they're healed. Almost every time. Not every time, but almost every time. That, when we begin to see that, and when we begin to see success, that is a strong indicator that that is our area of gifting. A lot of times, divinely directed desire. You find yourself wanting to do this or to pray for certain individuals or to, you know, uh, there, there's a, a burden that God will put upon you. That itself is an indicator of the area that you're, you know. And listen, folks, God's going to bring this thing together so you as well quit fighting it. You, but what if I'm wrong? That's what we're fixing to get into now. One of the biggest hindrances to working in gifts of the Spirit I am not going to be able to get into two or three of these scriptures. That's all there is to it. Turn over to Matthew 13 right quick. Or Matthew 25, I'm sorry. St. Matthew 25. Yes, St. Matthew 25. That is where we will find the parable of the ten virgins. We also find the, uh, the talents being distributed. Incidentally, uh, the, the talent in the Bible was an amount of money. It was something that was entrusted to this person for them to take and use it for the benefit of the kingdom of God. You see, God places certain giftings, graces, gifts of the Spirit, talents, abilities in your life. And what you do with them, you're going to have to answer for one of these days. He's going to call you up and say, give account. I blessed you with the ability to do these things. How did you use it? People don't realize it. There are giftings and graces and callings, everything from being a witness to praying for sick to even giving. You know, there are some of God's people that are blessed with an enormous amount of financial, a bunch of it. You know something? That didn't come along just by accident. They were given that to use for God and at his direction. Now, he don't mind them taking care of their needs, but he says, here, I'm giving you part of the money for my kingdom and I want you to use this money to further my kingdom under my direction. And they take and squander it and hold it. I don't think I will. They'll give account one of these days. They'll just walk up and say, hey, I want to know what you've done with the money I gave. But, uh, Lord, I made this money with my two hands. Who gave you the breath and the health to make it? There's going to be people walk in one of these days. And I know a preacher. That, well, I won't, <laughs> I won't go into that. But he said, don't bring it to me. After your dollar's no good. Said, I'll throw it back at you and tell you to let it perish with you. So, you know, kind of strong stuff. But uh, Peter and them done that. As a fellow said, here, I'll give you this money to give me that gift. And Peter said, your money will perish with you. So, but anyway, talent here is not necessarily a talent such as we know. This is an amount of money. There were some men that were given certain amounts of money. And if you look down at verse 14, he said, the, the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling to a far country. He called his servants, delivered unto them. Whose goods? His goods. His giftings. His anointings. His gifts. His abilities. And he gave them to each one. And he told them, Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, another one, and every man according to his what? Several ability. And straightway took his journey. He gave them something that he intended for them to use not for their own good, but for his good. And then when he come back, he, uh, let's see... Then, verse 16, then he had received five talents and traded with the same. But he had received one. Went. After a long time, verse 19, the Lord of those servants cometh, and he reckoneth with them. Folks, Jesus Christ is going to say, okay, son, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, you didn't give me anything. Yeah, I did too. What did you do with it? Uh, well, I never did know. I just figured if it was there, you'd work it when you got ready to. No, you didn't even try to discover it. You, there were people that suffered. My body, my work, the furtherance of the gospel suffered because you wouldn't take the time to pray and seek my face and discover what I'd placed in your life. Folks, 
You better find a place with God and find out what it is he's put in your life. Because I can't do that for you. Now, notice he reckoned with him. And the first one said that it received five talents, came and said, brought his talents. Verse 20 saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. I've gained beside them five more talents. The Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You can't expect God to bless you with more if you're not being faithful over what little bit he's given you right now. Use what you've got, and then he'll add more. Now, he goes on down, but he comes down this one guy, and the guy took his amount of money, hid it in the bank, or hid it in the ground, and he come back in verse 24. He said, Then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strong. I was afraid and went and hid thy talent there. Lo, there thou hast, it, this is, in other words, here it is back. Now, what hindered this man? From using his giftings, his abilities, what was it that hindered him? Verse, what was it? Yeah, but 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 what? Why was it that he? You know, verse twenty-five. He said, "I was afraid. I was scared. I was scared to pray for somebody sick. I was afraid they wouldn't be healed, and I'd look stupid. You know, we're so concerned about how we look." I, I'm afraid to step out and give this guy a word and all. Folks, listen, I have prayed for people and I've said, God, I pray you bless this man's children, this woman's children. I ask that you help him in uh, any area of his work, get him work. or whatever. And people say, well, so what? What's so great about it? Well, it's nothing except this. What if he don't have no children? You ever thought about that? What if he's got a job? What if you start praying for somebody and say, Lord, I pray you'd open doors for this man's ministry. Give him a ministry, Lord. And the guy's pastoring a church of 500 people already. You know? There's risk involved in ministering spiritual gifts. There's risk involved, and you and I take a chance of looking kind of silly. Now, we're so worried about our reputation. To devil with your reputation, Lord. You know? You know, if your kingdom suffers, I'm not going to take a chance. I'm comfortable back here. I'm not risking anything. As long as I'm not risking, I can't be hurt. I can't be looked upon. Uh, you know, I, nobody can uh, say that. I can just sit over here. And Lord, if you want to do these things, then you'll just do it. That's why we don't see many of it. Because we're waiting on him to do something, and he's waiting on us to do something. Many times there are gifts that will not be ministered because you and I will not step out in faith. Folks, God does not have to hit you with a bolt of lightning to tell you it's time for you to interpret a message, give a message in tongues, give a prophecy, give a word of knowledge, lay hands on somebody, discern a spirit. God doesn't have to. Many times it's that slight, gentle nudge. But what if I'm wrong? Chances are there will be times you will be wrong. There's one way to keep from being wrong. Just don't ever do it. You know, just there's one way you can protect yourself, and that's just don't ever try to do anything. There's one way that you cannot be rejected by people out here on the street witnessing to them. Just don't ever witness to them. I was a fellow, I come across up there and shoved out, out of the ditch, and I started getting back in my truck, and the Lord said, uh, Aren't you forgetting something? <laughs> oh, well, you know, Lord, what, you know, what if he's already a Christian? What if he ain't? And so I, I felt like he was. And so I had the right thing to give him. And I said a few things to him about his children and one thing or another and handed him a track and left. How did I even know the man had any kids? You know, try listen, God wants you to take this stuff outside here. You know, now this guy's life may have been touched by that. Let's hope it was. There are times, you know, that, that I've uh, walked up... Uh, we was up there singing the other day, and there was a lady standing out there, and I just called her over. I said, I want to pray with you. Nobody heard me, so my reputation pretty safe, but I started rebuking all kinds of things. A woman could have been a Christian for all I know, but I was, you know, Lord, break this power, break that power, give her this, do that. You know, what I'm saying is, folks, there is risk involved. We are surrounded by not only an unbelieving world, but a church world that is full of skepticism. We're, we've got a Pentecostal, charismatic, apostolic, Holy Ghost movement out here. 
that believes in the gifts of the Spirit, that, but the minute you try to work in one, they're ready to jump on you and criticize you and humiliate you and everything else. Full of doubt, full of unbelief. Let's just let God do it when he gets ready. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. We don't have time, but what was one of the things that hindered the workings of God in the ministry of Jesus at one particular place? Can somebody tell me? Exactly. Don't turn to it. We don't have time. But Mark 6, and uh, Jesus went down to his own place of Nazareth, and verse 5 said, And he could there do no mighty works, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. It didn't say he wouldn't. It said he couldn't. God won't violate his word. And you have got to get folks to believe. Now, not only do I have to get people to believe that God can do this. Everybody does. You can go to a church and say, you believe God can do this? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Everybody raise their hand. Everybody believe God can heal tonight? Yes, sir. You believe God can give you a word tonight? Yes, sir. Amen. We're all re- we all hold our hands up and say, yes, sir. But then when I say, do you believe God will do it right now and right here if I bring you up here? Well, you know, he might, uh, you know, uh, you know, get somebody else to do it. You know, they, they, they need a word. You know, we're automatically met with skepticism or uh, he's trying to impress everybody. He's trying. No, what he might be trying to do is operate in what God's called him or her to do. You know, and a lot of times when people are met with skepticism like that, guess what they're doing? They're just cheating themselves out of a blessing that God's trying to give. You see that skepticism. Let me give you and and again, let me stress this i'm not a branhamite but i studied the ministry of william branham and he said that the lord told him that he had certain gifts and he said you've got to get the people to believe you and he said if you can get the people to believe you nothing will stand before your prayers not even cancer it wasn't enough to get the people to believe that god could do it they had to believe that god had anointed him to do it see what i'm saying They had to come to a place where, yes, I believe God has put those anointings in you, and I believe that if I'll come with confidence, not only in God, but in your calling, folks try to receive something and bypass God. You see, God limited his activities to the body of Jesus Christ, the flesh body of man Christ Jesus while he walked upon the earth. God could have healed Bartimaeus without Jesus going by there, but he didn't heal him until he went by. The, the, the healings were limited to the activities of Christ. Well, I believe for the most part, we don't want to limit God, but for the most part, if God's going to do anything on the earth now, He's going to limit those activities to His body, the body of Jesus Christ. And not only does people have, you know, have they got to believe that God can, you know, they've got to come and believe we are of God. William Branham used to say, Do you believe I'm a servant of God? Do you believe that God has spoken to me and told me these things? And if the people said, well, you know, I don't know. Well, go on and sit down. Do me no good to pray for you. But if they, he always did. I've got tapes that he'll say, do you believe that I'm a servant of God? That I'm a prophet of God? Do you believe that God has told me this? And when the people said, yes, I do. All right, then I can help you. He said, you have to believe I'm of God or I can't help you. And that's it, folks. You've got to believe not only that God can, but that he will. You know, I have confidence in your prayers. When you pray, I believe that God's going to do something. Now. We've got skepticism. Let's let's show you one real quick. That I've, I've got to real hurry here. Turn over to St. John chapter 1. I want to show you something here. St. John chapter 1. We're going to talk about uh, when... Uh, Jesus first called some of his disciples. I want to show you a gift of the Spirit that most of us would have criticized. It said, verse 44, Now Philip was of Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip finding Nathanael and said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law of the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Now stop right there just a minute. Is there any big revelation in this? Jesus said, Right there's an Israelite that there's no guile in. Man, you know, just a simple statement, ain't it? But here we see the mighty power of God working. He's starting to stir. He started that anointing's there. And he knows. And folks, listen. What God will do is he will anoint you. 
He will put that little urge, that little thump in your heart, but you must step out in faith to minister any gifts of the Spirit, any of them. You must step out in faith, believing that God will meet you there. And if you sit back here in your comfort zone, where you're comfortable, there's no risk. You're not going to look like a fool. You will never, ever experience a gift of the Spirit. What if I miss it, Brother Bruce? You probably will. And you're going to run into a lot of people full of skepticism, but let them be skeptical. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to somehow, God's people is going to raise up, break through this skepticism to where these things are commonplace in our midst. Because we're going to be walking close to Jesus. We're going to be sold out to Him. And folks, then we're going to have people coming here instead of coming to a mediocre church service and say, well, their songs are nice. Uh, you know, the lady in my right was dressed real nice. They seem like nice folks. They're going to come and meet God. Let's go and see what Jesus said here in verse 48. He said, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou I me? Mean, where do you know me from? Jesus answered and said, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Where is that a big revelation? I tell you, before Philip called you, I saw you up under the fig tree. You know, what would you do if I said, Brother, I saw you standing in your yard up underneath that walnut tree this morning. Well, big deal. What's, what's so big? What I'm saying is, that's not a big mighty revelation. You know, some of us would have said, well, I believe if that was of God, he should have told me my name. He should have told me what I was thinking about, the very words I've been praying. Uh, I think he should have told me my wife's name. I think that he should have known all of that about me and know where I was at yesterday. Then I'll believe. Jesus didn't tell this man all these things. He said, I saw you under a fig tree. And look what Nathaniel did. He said, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. It convinced him. That small little revelation. What I'm saying, folks, is a lot of times Jesus didn't deal in big, specific, major words of knowledge. Sometimes the revelation was sort of shallow and general. But it was a revelation nonetheless. It was to be acknowledged. Says, we rob ourselves out of blessings because we skip over these little revelations, these little words. Emma said some things to me the other night that ministered me. She don't know it probably. Perhaps she does. But it confirmed. She don't know what I was praying. And it was right on. Confirmed it. Now, what should that do to me? That bless me. That give me some encouragement. Not only that, that should let her know that's a possible area of anointing in ministry there. See? See what I'm saying? Now, folks, there are a lot of people that you could call them up and say, Listen, I saw you up underneath the tree here the other day. And God wants you to know that, and he's, he knows about your problem. And they say, well, you know, big deal. Somebody probably told him. You know, there are people that rob themselves out of blessings because they're so skeptical. And I'm not talking about the unbelieving world. I'm talking about Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians. Skeptical of it. Now, what are we to do? We're to first off realize that to every man is given the gift of the Spirit. You may need to spend some time in fasting and prayer. You need to get around some prophetic ministry. Drive to another town. Whatever. Find some somewhere. I know there's a lot of junk going on in America, but there's some right too. There's some ministries that are true. Right in the thick of the wrong, usually you'll find the right. Fast and pray. God will direct your desires and you can come into a place of an anointing where you know that that is, you know, that's it. Now, let me call something else to your attention here real fast. Number one, there's two sides of this. One man told me one time, you can't slice a piece of bread so thin that there's not two sides to it. So there's two sides to this. Number one, you can't expect God to put his anointings on you and you live loosely, spend little time or no time in prayer, uh, live worldly, ungodly, uh, things of that nature. I'm, you know, it, it's... Uh, he'll, he'll withdraw his hand to a certain extent. However, on the other hand, gifts and calling are without repentance. And I am not encouraging you to sin. I'm not meaning to encourage you to lose lax living. But I want to tell you this. The Corinthian church was carnal. There were divisions among it. You and I probably wouldn't even attend a church like that. There was immorality in it. And yet Paul said that they didn't come behind in any gift. They had gifts of the spirits, babukus and oodles. Do I believe in gifts? Yes, I do. But folks, you can have all the gifts of the spirit in the world and have no character. And that right there, you're only going to hurt. If you've got gifts of the spirit and you don't have no character and you don't live a life, you know, 
You've seen one day in here interpreting a message in tongues and the next day out here telling some vulgar joke or something. Guess what? You brought reproach on the thing you love. You do better to get some victory or leave it alone, one of the two. Now, there's a middle of the road on this thing. We need to find it and get in it. I don't believe God is withholding gifts because he's stingy. I don't believe that he's necessarily waiting for some proper time. I believe, number one, we need willingness and we need opportunity. Willingness we need to have. The opportunity I can't provide. We need to school ourselves in these things and learn them. I believe that God will have each of you ministering gifts of the Spirit. And guess what? I've said this here before. It's much like a muscle. What happens to a muscle if I just let it hang there and don't ever use it? It, it turns to flab. It shrinks up. It gets to, what would you say, Mike? It, it just, it naturifies. What would you call it? That's over my head, brother. Uh, let's break it down here in terms we can understand. He's just real educated. You, he can't help that. Uh, <clears throat> what happens if I don't use this muscle over here is it gets to a point where I can't use it. I'm no good at it. It just turns to flab. It's useless. The old saying is not scripture, but the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. That applies. But what happens if I'm constantly using this muscle? It will develop. It will grow stronger. You know, and the Bible says this. It says in one scripture, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 14, it says that we should seek to excel in the gifts. God Almighty tells us, this is God talking, and he says, desire spiritual gifts. It's wrong to desire the gifts without the one that gives the gifts. That's where the wrong comes in. But the Bible says, seek the Lord and his strength. There's nothing wrong with that. And we need to seek to excel in them. That means exceed and do a lot better. And one scripture says, uh, you know, having our, I wish I'd turn to it, uh, our spiritual senses uh, by reason of use, it says, what I'm talking about, about exercise, it backs up the very thing I'm talking about. It's over in Hebrews, you know, having our spiritual senses exercised. Exercise will produce, you know, the more that you're used it, you used one time in a gift. And, and, and let me tell you this, if you, if you step out there to use the gift another time and it fails, don't let that discourage you and cause you to just, well, I, I forget it and don't ever try to get, go right. What happens if you get thrown off a horse and you want to ride that horse? crawl right back on that jaybird and say i am going to ride you you know if you mess up once go at it again in fact you know you're probably going to mess. i have uh preached and stood up and if my first time i was ready to set the world on fire and i stood there and i stuttered and i stammered and i went uh uh, uh, uh and i said oh lord i'm not calling i sit down well a guy got me back up again fortunately and that was a little better and then next time a little better. And now I like preaching. I, I, it don't bother me. I can talk to 500 people and talk for five hours. I, you know, it really doesn't, doesn't bother. What happens? It's a gift, and that gift's been exercised enough. Now, let me throw this in, then we're going to close. I do not get a special word from God telling me that he's going to anoint me when I get up here. I don't. I don't. God don't say, Bruce, if you preach this morning, I'm going to anoint you. And if he don't say it, I just sit down. No, I ain't got the anointing. I'm, no, it's a gift and a calling. And I expect that when their need is there, you've come here to be fed. When your faith puts demand on that gift and the need is there, and I present myself, then God will anoint. Many times when I stand up here, guess how much anointing I feel when I first get here? None. Zippo. You know, if I waited for the Spirit to move me supernaturally, I'd sit over in the corner a lot of time. There wouldn't be no sermon. And none of the rest of us would either. What we do is we move out into that and God meets us. It's the same way with gifts of the Spirit. You don't have to wait for God to speak from heaven with an audible voice saying, I want you to give a message in tongues. I want you to give a word of knowledge. What you're feeling now is a word of knowledge about this. Listen, do it. And there's ways to find out. What if I have this picture and I give it? It wound up being wrong. Well, listen, a lot of times when folks will tell you it's wrong, whether it's wrong or right. I could tell you some examples where people told me, oh, that wasn't right. And I thought, oh, God, I felt bad. And then come to find out it was. You know, because they told other people. And other people come and said, they told me that was right. And then there's a lot of times my reception of it is wrong. We must keep in mind God's gifts are perfect, but his vessels are imperfect. 
So we need to keep that in mind. Are there any questions along these lines? We're going to close this out. Shut this thing off. Is the tape turned back on? Okay, let, let's all pray because I perceive in my heart, and I'm not saying this just, uh, I, I want this on tape. I'm not saying this to try to get on this man's good side. I'm not trying to impress him. There's nothing he has said or done that causes me to say this. But I perceive in my heart that he's seeking God for clarity. He, he needs some clarification in some areas that he's seeking God. He wants to know uh, if he's called to certain things or not. You know, I am not God myself. But I believe that the Lord would say to him, I believe the Lord is definitely stirring, and I see a variety of giftings in this man's life that God is wanting him to discover. I believe that there are different skills that the Lord would bring.